K-I-L-R Killer Games Hello gamers, simmers, and pilots. I am the Killer Gamer, and welcome to my tour around the world featuring Microsoft Flight Simulator 5.1. We'll be specific and say point .1 because it has a few extra features that 5 did not have. Uh, especially the CD-ROM version, which is what this is. Okay, well... Where are we at? Well, let's just say that we just saw the... Um, biggest ball of twine in Minnesota while we're singing the Weird Al song and <laughs> let's talk about um, where we're at and where we're going here okay so we are right here uh, in Minnesota this is uh, Litchfield Municipal which is where we're at LGF, LGF Darwin so we're going to be flying this is going to be a bit of a flight now so we're going to be flying, we're going to uh, catch Minneapolis here, and we're going to be flying all the way over here to Eau Claire, Chippewa Valley, Valley, Valley Regional. So this is where we are going. All right, let's go ahead and get our radio set up here. We're going to want to tune in. Minneapolis to start off with. Uh, oh well, maybe not Minneapolis. Hold on here. Probably Gopher, I think. Yeah, so if I show this back up here again, uh, Gopher is right here. So Litchfield right here. And if we fly this way to Gopher and then come back and take this route down to Eau Claire so that is the thought that I have got for that so uh, we'll tune in 117.3 and let's see that is the 260 So we need to fly the back course of that. Right there. Well, that's like almost on it. Okay. And if we look at Eau Claire. Eau Claire. Eau Claire. So I guess we'll be leaving Gopher at 085 radio. Not too far from what we're doing. And we'll be taking Eau Claire, which is 112.9. Oops. Well, I don't know what was there before. I don't know. I think it showed up briefly because it was like 99 nautical miles. All right. So we're going to want the back course of 286. Or is it 281? No, 286. And I think I passed it. I did. There we go, 106. So it's nice when you can look at the bottom here. It's like, oh, okay, I need the back course of 286, which is 106. So makes it makes it easy. And we've got to get our adventure 
uh, factory started here so we can hear our ATC. Keep in mind this is only chatter. And let's go with this one here which will give us our high altitude ARTCC. Start a new adventure. Boom. We should be hearing some stuff here momentarily. Meanwhile, let's go to autopilot. We'll turn it off for, on for the moment. We'll change the altitude. It's going to be a bit of a flight. How about we fly at 6,000 feet? We can keep this in mind here. Maybe do nav one heading hold. I don't know. But uh, turn off autopilot there. And I think we are all set to go. Uh, let's see. Get our elevators set. We'll go and start. And then we're just going to go down the runway and turn around and take off. Oh, I remember when I could first play this after playing the Commodore 64 and the Amiga version, which is similar to Flight Simulator 3 and 4. Uh, playing this was just... Uh, what's it look like? like wow. 2298, uh, got a call uh, center on you. Got one going to LA. How do you I used to dream and wonder, it's like, man, won't, won't it just be cool when the day comes where we get a simulator where you look out and looks just like the, just looks just like real life. Well, we're about there. say FSX and X-Plane do a pretty darn good job. Pretty much X-Plane, that's, that's where I get the most of the realism from. But I will be getting prepared and I'm going to be using the mega scenery with that. Try to give it a little bit of a realistic feel. We're all set. Um, we just need to bring our flaps down so that way it changes the adventure. Starwest 466, runway one left, taxi into position, all tower. Uh, 466, position, all one left. That moves us to tower. And it's time to take off.
Well, we're on the right vector. Switch us over to departure. So, if you've been following previous um, flights, you'll know that the position of your flaps and your landing gear and what altitude you are will tell the adventure which set of wave files to play, whether it's ground or tower, departure, approach, you know, whatever the case is. scenery and those white patches which I'm not quite sure what they are I'm just assuming they are snow because this is the winter season Forty-four miles to go to the Gopher, and then who knows how far after that. This would be a long flight. Channel station twenty-two hundred zero five zero heading into the Federal three nine radial to Oviedo intersection retro country. Federal three nine to Oviedo retro 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 so I wonder we, we don't see him no we don't see him at all communication radio darn I was wondering if there might have been a com 2 here and you had to tune it in here instead of on here but nope that is not the case. Would have been nice, but... Dims the brakes. Sounds like she was saying a feline. It's a kitty cat up in the air. And it looks like this Minecraft boxy cloud here. The sound stutters when I move the mouse.
Now, let's see, are we gonna climb above the Minecraft clouds? I believe we'll start hearing some Minneapolis Center ATC. <clears throat> that big blocky cloud right there. Yeah, well, you know the best they could do at the time. Which, hey, was definitely a step up from Flight Simulator 4. Flight Simulator 3 had these little spheres. <laughs> White bubbles. Flight Simulator 4 had, um... Kind of like discs. Oh, I think that one was real. Did you hear that? Minneapolis Center. Just to sound a little bit here. Huh. Bummer. I can't change the volume of the actual engine. I can just turn it on or off. Oh, that's a bummer. I wanted to be able to hear the Minneapolis Center a little bit more. I don't know how much we're going to be flying above, up in the clouds here. I think we need to adjust our altitude. Let's adjust our altitude to, we'll say 7,000. realize we don't want nav one it doesn't want to hold anyway notice that interesting
Got some flashing of the screen there. I don't know if that's normal or if that's just a result of DOSBox. Alright, we need to keep an eye on NAV2 there. In the meantime, let's continue on with our Flight Simulator 5.1 Strategy Guide. Alright, about the scenery. There are three types of scenery used in Flight Simulator 5.1. You've got the older 4.0 scenery, <laughs> which would actually give you more airports in the U.S. area. Um, so that's VGA 640 by 350, 16 colors. You've got the Cyber Graphics Synth City style, which is Super VGA 640 by 400, 256 colors. And then Photorealistic Ray Traced Super VGA 640 by 400, 256 colors. And... And we're still needing to adjust our heading here. Oh, I just heard Eau Claire. Okay. The older scenery that was used in Flight Simulator 4 employed simple polygon vector draw routines that simulated 3D buildings and other objects and it filled in the ground terrain with various pattern fills. Although it was an improvement over previous flight simulators, it was 1988 graphics technology that was long overdue for an overhaul. You can still use FS4 scenery in FS5.1, which is a boon to the many armchair pilots who have designed their own add-on scenery using the Aircraft and Scenery Designer 4.0, or bought add-on scenery packages from other companies. Ah, uh, yes. Aircraft and Scenery Designer. Right here. This is a wonderful program. It's going to really allow us to travel around the world with Flight Simulator 4. Because otherwise, there are many places we would not be able to fly. Let's see if we can get ourselves over to 080 here. Well, that I think will do it. We're loose a little bit here. All right. Or bought add-on scenery packages from other companies. Well, I don't, I don't know much for Flight Simulator 4 that was released, but um, if you do know of scenery that was released for Flight Simulator 4, let me know. I want to make sure I get all of it for our tour. Um, however, you would not be able to utilize the newer graphics that are available in Flight Simulator 5.1 while using the older scenery. Cyber Graphics Synth City Style for Synthesized City is a newer technology graphics engine developed by BAO, Bruce Artwork Organization, that is used in FS 5.1 to simulate city buildings, bridges, and other standard 3D objects. The city buildings of Chicago, off to the right of Meg's Field, are an example of Cyber Graphics Synth City Style. Cyber Graphics Synth City Style differs from the previous FS4 scenery in that you see many more features and details of individual buildings. For example, you can see lighted windows and skyscrapers, company logos on certain buildings and building shadow, shadows that move according to the time of day. Try checking out the Prudential Building sign in Chicago with scenery density set to high. 
As such, this type of scenery is vector drawn. That is, it, each image, image's shape is mathematically described and then filled in with a texture and color. Vector drawn graphics are easily scalable to any size and form perfectly straight lines, smooth curves, round circles, and symmetrical ellipses. We're moving. Hold on. What we need to do is set the autopilot to lock in on a certain heading. Okay. Let's go to autopilot and we'll say heading hold 79.22. That should be fine. All right, now maybe we won't drift away. <laughs> Thus, for example, you can perfectly round, you can see, <laughs> you can see perfectly round wheels. I can't see, I'm nearsighted. Uh, you can see perfectly round wheels on the landing gear of FS 5.1's four aircraft as opposed to the triangular shaped wheels of FS 4. And the appearance of the airplanes themselves is much more pleasing. Even more so than FSX at x -Pro. With smooth curving fuselages and wings as opposed to the jagged polygon shaped surfaces of FS4. Oh, FS4 has a charm to it there. Cyber, so does this. <laughs> Cybergraphic Synth City technology also allows highly detailed complex 256 color scenery such as sky shading and shadows, urban and suburban sprawl, coastlines, clouds, and oceans to be generated using a minimum of hard disk space storage. Using a new graphics technique called seeding. Seeding, wow. Way back then. A scenery area can be assigned a generic appearance whether it be forests, suburbs, mountains, coastline, etc. An example of seeded scenery is the suburbs and ground terrain of Chicago, on top of which sit the Cyber Graphics Synth City style 3D buildings. Seeded scenery such as this can be generated using just 700 bytes of data. The photorealistic ray trace scenery is derived from actual high altitude photos of the ground taken by satellite and aircraft. The airport runway at Mex Field and the immediate airport vicinity are examples of photorealistic ray trace scenery. The satellite photo of Mex Field has been texture mapped onto the ground, much like a decal is applied to a surface. But the ray tracing algorithm goes one step further. The photo or texture map can be wrapped around three-dimensional topographical features such as mountains, valleys, or other ground contours. As a result of this contour mapping, the scenery looks three-dimensional. What is truly amazing about this, though, is that it is all done in real time, rather than the many hours it would take using conventional ray tracing algorithms. Looks like we need to adjust our autopilot here just a tad. Let's see, can we type in something here? 80? Yeah, um, maybe that'll do. Alright. The term ray tracing itself refers to a computer graphics technique used to create complex 3D images. Every pixel in a ray traced image is drawn to reflect a light ray from a source of light and then is traced from the pixel to the viewer's eyes. Unfortunately, conventional ray tracing techniques can take many hours just to produce a single image. In FS 5.1, an advanced and speedy new real-time ray tracing algorithm developed by BAO 
breaks new ground with its speedy ray trace rendition of surface scenery. It allows simulated sunlight to produce the ground shadows and varying hues and colors of the terrain that produce the illusion of 3D perspective and depth. The actual photos of the ground are digitized into bitmaps broken up into many millions of pixels. Bitmaps are simply facsimiles of an original picture. That is, they copy each picture element and assign it a pattern and color, much like a PCX, BMP, GIF, or TIFF computer graphic. Unlike vector graphics, a bitmap is not easily scalable, meaning that significantly resizing the bitmap causes it to become deformed and misshapen, much like bitmap fonts become jagged and unreadable when you print them out in a font size that is much larger or smaller than the original bitmap font. With these new terrain bitmaps, the closer you fly to the ground, the less realistic the scenery will become because the individual pixel elements are expanded larger to the point where they become distorted. So, fly high, and everything looks good. <laughs> it's almost like the actual photorealistic scenery um, today looks great up in the air when you get down below. Well, not so much. FS 5.1 scenery is a combination of the photorealistic ray trace and cyber graphics technology. Cyber graphics vector drawn buildings are superimposed on the background bitmaps of the photorealistic ground scenery to arrive at a pleasing synthesis of 3D ground terrain with 3D buildings and objects it is a significant advance in PC-based flight simulation graphics. So the next section is, so, you want to be a pilot? <laughs> oh, hey, even goes into Flight Simulator 3 there. Man, this is a long section here. We're not even in chapter one, we're in the introduction. Chapter one is your first solo flight. Well, some of the stuff will be uh, skipping because we're obviously not going to do that. Chapter two, Windows on your world. Chapter 3, Simulation Controls. Chapter 4, Weathering the Weather. And then we go into Part 2, which is Ground School. Flight Basics, Exploring the Cockpit, Exploring Oh, I'm still exploring the cockpit. Basic flight maneuvers is chapter 8. Flying the Cessna is chapter 9. Flying the Learjet is chapter 10. Flying the Sailplane, 11. And then part 3 is navigation and aircraft. Route planning. Radio navigation. Then a whole bunch of pictures. Some good quality paper here. So I really was talking about Meg's field, right? So there you go. Well, so they're saying that's photo photorealistic. Not from a distance, it kind of does look photorealistic. Well, it looks like we are crossing over here. This looks like the Minneapolis area. We're close to it. I 
I think that below is the uh, Mississippi River. There's something down here. Uh oh. Oh, no, I think that. <laughs> I was going to say, I thought something was wrong. <laughs> I was trying to zoom in, and that's not quite working very well. I was looking to see what is actually down there. Definitely looks like an airplane, an airplane, an airport. <laughs> With some buildings and stuff down there. Uh, I believe that is from the author. Well, we're, we're probably now in Wisconsin if we're flying over the river. So this would be part of another uh, set of scenery. A different author. Well, that airport looks like it's got some detail, though. Zoom. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Wow, look at the detail that went in that the author put into this airport. Look at that. That's a lot of detail. I think we have a storm front or something coming our way. Alright, we need to change this to 8 5. And turn that off. Gotta wonder how far the airport is.
I'm going to figure if we're flying the, uh, the routes that are on the IFR map, hopefully that will... Oh, now I know why it looks so cloudy. <laughs> it's because we were zoomed in. I know this is all pixelated, but man, this was a this is a big deal when it first came out. I didn't even have a PC when I first got it. I bought it first, and then I got a PC later. And the PC, the first PC I had was a Pentium ninety. And I couldn't have all the graphics bumped up. It was still faster than what I was trying to use, which was a PC emulator on an Amiga computer. And that was kind of like a, a series of um, <laughs> slideshows. It was not fast. I loved my Amiga computer. I had an Amiga 500 and then a 2000 and then I got a 4000. And that was the extent. I actually still have those computers too. Although I don't think the 500 works anymore. I tried to do some um, expansion stuff inside and it wound up mess, messing it up or something. Man, we're going fast. That's okay. This would be a very long flight if we weren't going full power. Yeah, I know. We're probably going faster than what the FAA would allow, but... We got places to go. Things to see. Things to do. People to see. Change ourselves here. in at 85.13.
Still nothing. Take a look at my uh, pilot's binder here. Let's take a look and see what he's got for Wisconsin. Uh, we got a map of the state, some road maps. List of airports. A lot of airports here. Oh, let's see. Now we got some visual maps here, just so you can see what I'm looking at. Let's go Rhinelander. Not quite what we're looking for. Let's see. Lakeland, Noble, Noble Field. Ashland, John F. Kennedy Memorial, yeah. I'm actually going to be flying there, there's this Appleton, Appleton International. CW, KCWA, what is that? Central Wisconsin? Mossany? Not sure. Central Wisconsin, Mossany, United States. Interesting design for an airport. It's an L shaped. Look at that. goodies do we have in here? Uh, let's see, that's an approach chart for KCWA. Yeah, he's got a lot of pages here. Let's see what we can find. Actually, I think I found... Clear. Well, we got some localizers, 109.5. I've got the nav radio correct. It does say 112.9. Here is a map of the airport. Um, don't know if it's going to look like that in Flight Simulator 5. <laughs> Let's see, we have an approach chart for runway 22. Oh, is that the only one? Yeah, that's the only one.
I'm trying to make use of my binders as much as I possibly can. We'll be using it a lot when we uh, start flying into other countries and stuff because, oh, I definitely don't have maps and things for that. Okay, so we have a little bit of a challenge here. Um, the scenery for the area that we're flying in is downloaded, and it erased the, um, the nav beacon that we need to use. <laughs> so I had to deactivate it. Um, in order for the VOR to work. So we'll get onto our heading and then we can turn it back on, like as we get closer. Or we just basically take, oh, when we get, you know, 46 plus 36, so 92 miles away, pretty much. I kept thinking that should have tuned in by now, but at least we have not passed our actual vector yet. Looks good. We'll go ahead and lock in at huh, not one oh seven. One oh five, go over here. Yep, that looks good. And we seem kind of high up, so how will we bring it down to 5,000? We're going to have to bring our throttle down. We're going a little too fast. So right now we're just using the default uh, area scenery and for the default flight simulator 5 scenery there is like nothing out here. There's no airports. Nothing. Um, the only thing for Wisconsin... So, uh, so that's what you mean. You gotta either create your own scenery or, or download it. Um, Wisconsin... Those are the vores. It's got tons of vores, so you can you can um, definitely travel around the whole world. There's just not a whole lot of airports. Okay, so Wisconsin has got Milwaukee and Oshkosh, and that's it. 
So if you want more, you gotta either create it or make it. the altitude for the airport. It must be low. The approach chart is saying we need to come in at 2,900. Taste. You got ten saves. Pinterest. I haven't used Pinterest in a while. I don't have to start using it though. We have to plan our meals out in advance. And Pinterest has got a lot of good recipes. All right, nine hundred and thirteen feet is the elevation. Hmm. Man, 2900 doesn't seem very high to do an approach. I think we're pretty much locked into it. Let's see here. 34 and 47 is going to make that about 81, right? 81? So when Nav 2 says 81 miles, well, we should be really close there. So let's go ahead and load that scenery up here. Um, what we're going to do is click on scenery, go to scenery library. We're going to uh, make sure FS5 World is selected. Click Scenery Area Files. Here they are. Uh, this is the scenery that I created right here. Um, there's a few airports that we're going to that um, were not created by anyone, so I did those. So Wisconsin. We'll edit. Make it active. Click OK. And OK again. And OK again. And you'll notice that the nav is now off. You see that? But we are locked. We are locked in. Um, we are flying all over the place. Let's uh, change your altitude to 4,000. Not too much to see around here, is there? So we're about 30 miles away. This looks like a river up here. Name 
my throat's really dry. See if I can find the emulator that I used to use on the Amiga. I physically still have it. Said, utilities unlimited implant implant e586 module review that's what it was wow it's all text I was hoping they would have a uh, the implant e586 DX upgrade is quite possibly one of the most sought after holy grails in Amiga history for over a year, its feasibility and the probability that it might someday actually exist was battled over, sometimes rather violently, in comp.sys.amiga.emulations. Supporters of Jim Drew, the creator of the implant, and disbelievers, who were quite vociferous, formed factions and battled on a day-to-day -day basis for months and months. It would seem the E586 ranks right up there with the video toaster, before its release, and of course the Mac emulation before its release. Yeah, I used to... You could emulate a Mac pretty darn good with an Amiga because it used the same processor, um, the Motorola, but a Motorola trying to emulate an Intel Pentium was a whole nother thing. With the inception of the E586 software, users were promised the ability to truly run multiple operating systems on the same computer at the same time without any additional expensive hardware. The E586 promised to be many times faster and more compatible than any other software emulation on any other platforms. It was a dream come true for Amiga users. We could keep our Amigas, yet still be able to run all of the popular software previously available only to users of other operating systems. <laughs> yeah, right. In the nutshell, here is what you should expect from E586 version 1.1. You must obtain a BIOS. Uh, emulation recognized and formatted a partition. Uh, SCSI 2 Amiga, MS-DOS installed with no problem. Windows will not work. Don't waste your time trying at this point. After manually installing Windows as the install crashes on the second disk, Windows will attempt to run. All you will see is a nasty yellow Windows startup screen made of pixelated vertical bands, blah, blah. I eventually did get Windows working, but it was dog slow. I think that after a few more updates, this will be a fine, usable product. As it stands, it is not very useful unless all you want to run are text-based DOS programs. Oops. 
what the actual card looked like. It was using an implant board. Yeah, that looks like it. That was the implant board right there. You plug this into your Amiga computer and you would be able to emulate a Macintosh. And uh, I forget how you would do the 586. I think there was some type of chip you had to add on it or something. Like I said, I still have mine. I got stuff like packed away in boxes and who knows what. It's interesting though, that's as far back as I've gone with emulation. It's back with emulating a Macintosh. The other Macintosh one was called Shapeshifter, and it didn't require a, a board at all. And there is this back and forth fight between Jim Drew and whoever the guy was that created Shapeshifter because one accused the other of stealing the, their code. And whereas the implant board, you couldn't run the Macintosh emulation without it, the, the um, Shapeshifter one was able to do it without hardware. And in some cases, some of the programs worked pretty good under Shapeshifter, and other ones worked better under Implant. It was a um, interesting time, <laughs> to say the least. But yeah, I tried to run Flight Simulator 5 on the Implant board in my Amiga with the E586. And like I said, I did manage to get like Windows installed, and it was somewhat usable, but trying to get this to work, oh my word, yeah. And that's what eventually got me to push me to get my first PC, which was a Packard Bell Pentium 90. Blah! Horrible machine. I could play Flight Simulator though, but yeah, the first things I did with that machine, I had, um, yeah, oh, I forget, I still have it, it's like, a, it's a Microsoft uh, set, it had, um, I think it, it had Microsoft Works in there, and, and, and a few other things too. Works was like a combination of Word and a few other things. And a flight simulator, it was the very first computer I tried the main emulator on. But I couldn't expand it for nothing. So, and that was the last computer I would ever buy as far as a PC. I built everything else after that. I built my own stuff. And I believe, I don't remember, but I believe that the first computer that I built is the one that I played Flight Simulator 98 on. But I don't remember. It's been that long. I 
I think it was an A, um, because I didn't get Intel. I got an AMD, I think it was an AMD K62, I think is what it was called. And then I tried to expand the motherboard to a K63 and well, that didn't quite work out. <laughs> Okay, I think we are 10 miles away. I think the airport is up here. So let's get our autopilot off. to keep our eyes out for the airport. I believe we're 10 miles away. We'll go ahead and start our descent. It's really hard to make out anything with all the pixels. It's out here though. I think it's over in this direction. I see something right there. That might be the airport. Because see, I see a little patch of green, which usually represents the airport. Until we get closer. Of course, we can't see the runways at all from here, if that is it. We're going to have to wait until we get closer. I think this is it. That feline is all over the place. Yeah, the only thing that's going to have a green patch is the airport, which is right there. I see it. All right. Time to start getting some landing gears down and getting ready for our descent. Well, we are descending, but... United 2156, reduce speed to 170. You're number two on the downward call. Company traffic call the box six miles out of uh, 11,000. Okay, flight of one. Okay, so we're listening to departure right now. Okay, 
Okay, we're gonna be landing at that runway right over there. I think we've been switched over to a tower. Because we're down at a certain... Uh, when, you, when you have your gear down and you get to a certain uh, uh, altitude above ground level, it'll switch you to tower. Zero zero five two seven nine 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 the river. No, don't blow us off course. And we are landed. Did you see the traffic you were following earlier on the downwind? I did, I Okay, uh, why'd you turn and sign them? I don't know. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Sorry. Three, six, delta, freaks, you change. Alright, so we're heading at one, f well, one through seven. And according to this, there is... An air, yeah, there is a runway. There's a runway 14. So, yeah, I think uh, this is definitely it. And it is a two runway airport. And plus, there's really nothing else out here. <laughs> No taxiways or anything. I'm like looking for the other runway here. Uh, 
Well, I don't think they designed this uh, airport very well because they're not that close together as far as these runways, as far as the end of the runway. See, here's the actual map, and we landed right over here. And if we were to bring up the map view here, um, okay, the map view is not going to come up, never mind. <laughs> I think it was behind the window. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about it. All right. Uh, anyhow, we're here at Eau Claire, Wisconsin. That was definitely a bit of a flight. Definitely a bit of a flight. But cool deal. Well, thanks for joining me. Uh, we went through. Um, we went through the binder just a little bit as far as uh, finding uh, some maps and charts which <laughs> didn't really use the chart because there wasn't anything to tune in um, but we also went through the flight simulator 5 strategy guide a little bit and I talked about uh, the emulator board that I used to use or try to use on the Amiga computer as far as trying to get this thing to run which <laughs> was not a great success but yeah Anyways, thanks for joining me on this flight, and be sure to check it out on the other simulators, and I will see you on the next leg of our journey. Take care. And if you had fun watching this flight, then you might enjoy watching the same flight on one of these other simulators. It's a great way to compare the difference between them, but it's also a nice way to relive some old memories, or make some new ones. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you around in the wild blue yonder.